So as Mark was saying, um, I'm the district superintendent for this area. I don't, as my, many of you know, some of you maybe don't. Uh, the Bon Accord Community Church is a member of the Evangelical Free Church of Canada. And uh, the area that, that, that you're in, that we're in, is the Alberta Parkland District, which is from about Stettler North, our most northern church is in high level. And uh, as superintendent, it's my role to oversee the churches and the pastors and the ministries um, throughout that area. We have 30 churches in our district. And so that keeps me busy on the road quite a bit. Uh, I help pastors uh, and try to encourage them and help them along and, and, uh, and, and sometimes uh, be the pastor that, that they need uh, be in, when they're caring for people all the time. I help churches in transition, whether it's, whether it's transition from between pastors or or they're seeking a, a new vision or a new, new way forward if they've got stuck somewhere or sometimes, unfortunately, that involves helping churches with conflict and things like that. And uh, today it's my, my pleasure to help you out by, by bringing the word. And so that's one of the ways I serve our churches as well. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. I want to open our Bibles today to 2 Kings chapter 4. Um, 2 Kings chapter 4, we've already sing about the, sung about the days of Elijah, and so we're kind of in that time period in this story. And I want to read to you, uh, starting in verse 1, just a few verses here. 2 Kings chapter 4. One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, threatening to take my, my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you? Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full, full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your presence with us today. Uh, we confess that sometimes your presence uh, escapes our awareness. We forget about it. Uh, we live as though you're not there. But we want to acknowledge you as we have in our songs and our prayers this morning already that you are here with us. Lord, I pray that as we, as we think about what this story challenges us with and encourages us with, that each one here, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would know and understand what it means for their lives. And so, Lord, bless us as we look at your word, as we fellowship together and go about our, our day after we leave here. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, just last weekend, uh, my wife Colleen and I had a chance to go on a, a little outing, and we went uh, we went down to Banff and spent some time there, uh, and then we drove up to uh, Jasper, and then we came home, uh, a little three day uh, three day outing, and uh, one of the things that happened as we were there, uh, we we'd done the things we wanted to do at Banff, and we decided we we didn't really have a plan to start out, but we decided we're we're going to drive up the Icefields Parkway beautiful drive uh, to Jasper. And so as we, as we went north from Banff up the highway, uh, first it started to rain and then it started to snow. And uh, I think I have a picture, not, not my picture, but there's a slide there. Oh my God. It got to be something like that. I, I got that off the internet, but it's pretty close to what we were experiencing. And the, the fog just came in down around the road and the, the, had to turn the windshield wipers on every, every few seconds to wipe the snow and rain off the, off the windshield. And um, as we're driving along um, in this most beautiful place, uh, we couldn't see a thing. 
And uh, you've probably experienced something like that in your life, maybe not on that highway, but somewhere along the way. And one thing that I've noticed and was kind of feeling a little bit on that day is, is as the fog came in close and you had to slow down a little bit and be careful how you're driving and concentrate on that and forget about everything else, um, you can kind of get a little bit disoriented. Have you ever had that feeling and you're driving along in the storm or the snow or the fog and you think, am I really on the right road? Like, like I can't see any of the signs. I can't see any of the landmarks. Did I miss the turn off? Am I, am I really, should I just keep going? And, uh, and on, that day, on that day last weekend, I actually had that sort of feeling. Now, I knew on the Icefields Parkway, there is no other road. So I knew I was on the right road. But I, I was just remembering other times I've been driving in the fog and, and, and wondering if, I'm, if I've, if I've uh, gone off the path that I should be on and if I'm still in the right direction. But on that day last weekend, uh, I was thinking more along the lines of maybe, the, maybe we chose the wrong road. Maybe we should just turn around and go back to Banff. There was a bit more sun down there and uh, we could go uh, go in the hot springs or do find something to do in, 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 in Banff. If it's just going to be snowing and foggy up here in the mountains, then what's the point? So I really considered turning around and giving up on this, this project that we had to go up to Jasper and, and uh, we, we kept driving. And what happened as we were driving, it wasn't actually that long, and we started to see it through the fog, some areas a little bit lighter than others and some a little bit darker, so we knew there was something going on up above us. And then in, in one instant, um, the clouds parted uh, up above us, and and the sun just came through. You know how bright it is when you've been in the dark like that. And the sun just came through that little, little hole in the clouds. And, and I, the, we felt the sun, saw the sun first before we looked up. And then we looked up through the window of our vehicle to where the sun was coming through. And I expected to see blue sky. But I saw seemingly right above us just rock and ice. Something like the next picture. Although it was more... More, more closed in than that, but it's the best one I could find. We couldn't stop to take a picture. And it was just, it was just startled us, or startled me. It was just so surprising. We expected to see blue sky above us, but we saw rock and ice above us. Now, in our minds, in our intellect, we knew that we were driving the Icefields Parkway. And as you drive up that highway, the mountains come in closer and closer and closer until they seem to cover the, almost the whole sky around you. And we knew that in our minds, but with the fog and the snow, we'd lost track of that reality. We forgot they were there. Now, we knew they were, but we forgot, if that makes any sense. And so when that cloud opened up and we saw mountain instead of blue sky, it just, it just kind of surprised us. Oh, the mountains are there. In fact, they've been there the whole time. They never left. And, uh, and we, we were thrown into a, a bit of a involuntary worship session. We, we just, as the clouds then began to, to part and we saw more and more of the mountains, we were, we were overcome with awe and wonder at the, at the glory of God and his creation. And uh, we started to talk as we were driving about some Bible stories that this experience of seeing the cloud, being surprised by the mountains that we knew were they, we knew they were there, but still they surprised us. And uh, and and so I want to share a few of those stories. There's a there's a picture on the screen that that has those those Bible references. And um, can you see that? I can't. Okay, well, we'll just leave it at that. It, the reason for that screen was just, if, if you're not familiar with these stories, I'm just going to mention them very briefly, and uh, you might want to look them up later on to, to kind of get the full picture of these stories. But for many of you, these will be, be memories you have from, from Bible stories. Um, so, so if you remember the, the, when Moses uh, brought the people, God brought the people through Moses out of slavery in Egypt, and they were in this situation involving mountains as we were, but different kind of mountains. There was mountains on this side and mountains on this side, and the Red Sea in front and coming up behind was the armies of Pharaoh. And they had that feeling that the storms had come down, the clouds had come, the snow. I don't think there was snow, but that, that closed-in feeling. Did we take a wrong turn? Should we have followed Moses? We're going to die here. And, uh, and what, they, what they found out in that story is that through, through the, the leadership of Moses, the real answer was, keep going forward, you're on the right road. And the sea parted, and then the way opened, and they went through. 
Then there's another story uh, just, a, just a little bit later in Exodus chapter 16 where, where they were now on the other side of the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. And uh, they become hungry. And there's not much food around. And, they're, and they go into that same mode that I think all of you have experienced this in your life, but they were experiencing it in a big way. We must have, we must have taken the wrong path. I mean, we thought we were doing right to follow Moses here, but now we're starving. Now we're hungry. At least when we were slaves in Egypt, we had food. It wasn't the best situation, but at least we had food. And so they talked about turning around and going back and choosing a different road, a different path. We, we must have got off on the wrong track here. And, uh, and uh, then they went to bed, and they woke up in the morning, and the ground was covered with manna, and they had food in abundance. It turns out that they were on the right road. One of the stories that really emphasizes this type of point uh, over and over again is the story of, jo of Joseph. And it spans a bunch of chapters, 37 in Genesis and 39 to 42. And it seemed like his life was nothing but obstacles. It started out with a dream. It started out with a message from God. You're going to be a leader of people. And so Joseph began down that road and it seemed to run into problems again and again. First he was thrown in a well, then he was sold into slavery. Then he was uh, falsely accused in Potiphar's house. And then he was rising up in leadership in the jail and then he, he was forgotten there. And, and just like his whole life was this story. And then finally in the end, uh, when he was the, the prime minister of Egypt, uh, he, he had the perspective that, that said, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. The mountains were always there. Maybe in the prison or in the well, it seemed like the fog was in close and he couldn't see anything, but he kept on the path. In the New Testament, we have the same kind of stories. We can think of the Apostle Paul and his, uh, his call, his commissioning to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so he stepped out on that road in faith and started traveling. And he, he relates to us in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 16 and into chapter 12, the many hardships along the way about being shipwrecked, about being robbed by bandits, about being put in prison, about being beaten, and, and all of these different things. And yet he kept the course. He didn't understand those cloudy days as a question of whether he was on the wrong, wrong or right road. He kept going. Now, we do have a little bit of insight that he did actually question at some times and come to that place where he couldn't see God around him anymore. Um, and uh, that, that's most evident in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, verse 9 and 10, where he's talking about um, what he calls a thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what that is, but, but it could be injuries from some of his beatings or imprisonments. It could have been, been any kind of thing, but, but he had some physical ailment. Now, you and I know people, and maybe some of them are me or you, who have used that as a, as a reason to just let the clouds settle in. You know, I was on this path, I had these goals, I thought God was going to do things, but now I'm sick or I'm injured. And so I have an excuse. It's okay to just sit in my chair and get depressed and let the clouds come in and end the journey and say, okay, that's the end of the road. But this is what God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He was on the right road, and God had promised to sustain him. We think of Abraham and Sarah, Genesis 18. Uh, too old to have children, yet they had had the promise that they would be the parents of a great nation. And then the angel of the Lord says to them, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And you might think, well, there must be exceptions. I mean, I, you, can, you can almost look anywhere in God's Word and find story after story, account after account, that follows this type of pattern. The clouds close in. It looks like everything stopped, but then God comes through. 
the clouds open up and you see what you didn't expect. It's there. It was there all along. But that's only if you're on the road of faith, right? Well, have you ever read Jonah? Jonah was given clear direction to God, go to Nineveh, and he went the other way. He was on purpose on the wrong road. And what does it say when the sailors threw him into the sea? In Jonah chapter 1, 17, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Got him back on the right road. Even in his disobedience, God was there. Even when he rebelled, God provided an opening. Not maybe the opening you'd choose, the mouth of a fish, but an opening, a way back. The mountains remained steady, though he could not see them, or though he was trying to get away from them. This point, the same point is maybe made most clearly of all in another story involving Elisha. We began with the woman. He goes to, she goes to Elisha for advice. Here's another story about Elisha. And uh, this is the time, if you remember, when Elisha and his servant were in the city. It was completely surrounded by enemies. It was under siege. They were going to lose. They were overwhelmed. They were outnumbered. And, uh, and yet Elisha was not depressed. Elisha was not scared. But Elisha's servant... Had, you know, he had a, a serious case of the clouds and snow coming in and blocking out all, all light, all sense of hope or the future. And then Elisha prayed this prayer, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside. That's kind of like Colleen and I in the mountains. We looked up and saw the mountain where we didn't expect it. He looked up and saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Just beyond the visibility of his physical senses was the presence of God. It had never been away, even though he could not see it, even though he could not sense it, even though everything around him looked like the opposite was the case. The armies of God were right there. They were still on the right road. I think this is a common experience. I, I would be surprised if anyone in this room doesn't know what I'm talking about. When life has that situation, sometimes many times in life, but sometimes going on for many years, it's different in all of our lives, but that situation where, you know, I thought I was going the right way. I thought things were going right. I thought I'd made the right choices. I thought I was following God. But now all I see is fog and snow. And I'm not even sure the mountains are still there. I'm not even sure I'm on the right road. It's a common experience. So I have two questions I'd like to answer as I, as I finish out here. And, and one of them is, are we on the right road? How do you know if you're still on the right road, if you can't see much? And the other one is, how should we live when the clouds come, up, come in? The clouds come in. But how should we live in those circumstances? How should we live when that happens? So let's, let's consider the first question I want to turn to for Second Peter and just uh, look at a, a verse there that gives us some guidance uh, or a direction to think as you read God's Word. Then I want to return to the story of the olive oil in the jar. So in Second Peter chapter 1, um, I think there's a slide if we can see it. Uh, another one. Yeah, that one. How about instead of reading, let, let's read this together. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. All right, so, so are you... Are you still on the right road? Let's think about that. First, first, three things I want to notice in this verse. The first one is, it's in the past tense. His divine power has given us. 
It's not saying, we'll maybe, if you're good enough, give it to you in the future. No, no, this is past tense. If you're a person who's put your faith in Christ, if you're a person who's decided, I'm going to follow Jesus, this is already yours. His divine power has given. So past tense, that's really important. The mountains are already there. Maybe you can't see them, but it's already there. His provision is already there. He's already given it. So you don't have to pray for it. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to wonder if it's, if it's there or if God will provide. He has already given. Now the next thing I want to notice is that one word, everything. Now that's a very big word and not because it has a lot of letters. But just try to answer this question. What is not included in everything? What is excluded from everything? It's a big word, isn't it? It's a really big word. Everything. Okay, so, so you, you might think in your own self-consciousness, in your own pride, that you could do something that would somehow escape God and His provision. That you could, in your evilness, somehow outsmart Him and He couldn't, well, he couldn't possibly provide for this situation. No, no, everything. God has already, past tense, provided everything we need, and this is really, I think, the key here. We have to get the first two points, but the next one is key. What for? Everything for you to reach the goals you set? Has given you everything you need to fill your bank account? Everything you need to get the house and the life and the holiday that you wanted? Everything you need to ensure that every one of your children follow the Lord? No. Everything that you need for a godly life has already been provided. What road are you on? If the road you're on is, I want to be godly, then everything's been provided. That's why the Apostle Paul could say in his sufferings that I rejoice in my suffering because the path he was on was leading him towards a more godly life. It wasn't an easier life in the physical sense. It wasn't a life without hardship. It wasn't a life without cloudy days. Well, it was a life that led to greater and greater godliness. So if that's the road you're on, if that's the road your church is on, God has already given you everything you need to get there. So, th so that's, that's kind of... Um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes hard to believe that, but that's, that's kind of normal <laughs> biblical Christian theology uh, that I'm explaining to you. But the more important question, maybe, is the next one. How should we live when the clouds come in? What should we do when it gets hard? When we wonder if we're on the right road? What do we do? How should we live? How should we live without fear when the enemies surround? When the hardship comes? When the sickness attacks? When we lose our job? When we struggle financially to meet for ends to meet. When we the plans we had seem to be failing. And I'm I'm sure most, if not all of you, could fill in the blanks, probably already are, with stuff in your life that fits that category. I mean the the, the illustration I've given is when the when the fog comes in and the snow starts falling, and you're not sure you're on the right road anymore. What do you do then? Because in your mind, you believe the stuff I was just saying about God providing everything you need for a godly life. But in your experience right now, it's just cold and foggy, and you're not sure you missed the turn or not. That's the truth. How do you live? What do you do? Well, let's turn to 2 Kings again. 2 Kings chapter 4. 
I already read this story. I'm not going to read it again. But let's just think through this story a little bit. This, this woman in a hard spot. Now, the, the trouble we have with understanding this story is that we know the ending. But I want you to read it and think about it as if you don't know the ending. Can you, can you use your imagination a bit and pretend you're that woman in that situation and uh, you don't know what's going to happen? Uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can do that a little bit. But here's, here's what's going on. It first of all tells us that she was a member of the company or the school or the, 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 of the prophets. So her husband, just think, think about this for a minute. Elijah first, and then his disciple Elisha. If you read around in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and places like that, you, you, get, you can piece this together. Uh, it's not explicitly stated, but they had a school of prophets. And we don't know what that is. It's a different culture. It's a different landscape. It's a different time. But if you, if you just you know, read through those stories, you can pick up these clues. Elisha was a man of God called by God to bring God's word to the people, uh, to the kings. And uh, Elisha was his disciple. And they had, they had as, as, they've done, as they were doing their ministry, they would find people in different towns and places that either had a calling or an aptitude for being like them, being prophets. Being people who would go to village to village and bring God's word and, and, and declare God's word to people. And so, so they set up a place where there was a company of prophets. And, and uh, as far as we can tell, we have to use our imagination a little bit in the story. But it was probably quite a bit like what we would call a Bible college. A place where, where people would come and they would train and then they would go out to the different villages and towns and tribes of Israel and, and declare God's word. And then they'd come back and then they'd learn and then they'd go out. Now this man or this woman, her husband, had, had gone through that and obviously been successful. He was good at it. He was admirable because he was now stationed at the school to raise a family and have children. That means he's one of the teachers now. And so, so, so she's, been, she's been living this life with her husband in the service of God on a, on a path that seemed like the highest possible path you could have in terms of serving God. But then her husband dies. This prophet, this teacher of other prophets dies. And for reasons we have no idea why, uh, she finds herself in debt. A different system in those days, but... It seems brutal to us, but the, the equation was this. In her mind, remember, she doesn't know what's going to happen. In her mind, maybe I need to change course. The fog has come in. The snow is falling. I don't see a way out of this situation. Is God really faithful? Or should I take matters into my own hands and, and change course? And change course would mean allowing my children to go into slavery. At least they'd have had food. I can't provide them with food, but at least then they'd have food. And then turn my life away from this prophetic vision and go off somewhere and, and uh, probably uh, get sick and die or something. I don't know what she had in mind. But it's not good. She's, she's in a really dark place. She'd been following God with her husband for years. And now she's got these obstacles. It's really gotten cold and dark. So she does what you might expect her to do. She goes to the prophet, to Elisha, the leader there. And she asks what she should do. Should I keep going or should I change course towards defeat? Are you, are you asking this question in some part of your life? Am I on the right path? All I see is cold and dark. Did I miss the turn? Should I, should I switch course? Should I give up on the dream that God gave me? Do I have the excuse of illness, hardship? Okay, so... If we put ourselves in her shoes, Elisha says to her, what do you have? And she says, I have a, a flask of oil. And he says, go collect some jars 
So in my mind, I'm thinking of the, the little, uh, I think, scouts that came up to our door the other day and said, do you have, do you have cans and bottles? And we, we gave them some. We didn't give them all of them. And, uh, and we don't know what they were going to do with them, but kind of forget about it quickly. Nothing extraordinary here. Go to your neighbors and ask for a jar, an extra container of some kind. And nobody noticed anything was going on. And what Elisha told her to do is take from what you have and divide it up. Now, that is exactly the same thing she had been doing up till now. When she had a little bit of bread left, she would have divided it up between her two sons and herself, probably giving herself the smallest portion, and then there was, then there was no meat left, then there was no cheese left, then there was no bread left, now there's just the oil. Well, divide it up. So what Elisha was telling her, do exactly what you've been doing. Now, she doesn't know what's going to happen. So she doesn't know anything except, why are you telling me to do what I would have done anyways? With this little bit I had left, we would have just divided it up, and, and then that would have been it. So it's not, a, it's not a flashy thing. It's not an extraordinary thing. He's not asking her to do something. Oh, you're on the wrong road. Change course. Do this big thing. Re no, just keep doing what you've been doing. And she began to pour. And to her surprise, oh, there was more in the jar than I thought. I got a whole one to give to my first son. And then she began to pour. Oh, there's a lot more in the jug than I thought. Give it to her second son until all the jars they had gathered were full. It's a miracle of provision. But God hadn't asked her to drastically change course or do something different. God had simply said, keep on in faith in the direction you've been. Keep on in faith. Nobody knew. He specifically told her to close the door so that nobody would know. It wasn't for the world. It wasn't for everybody. It was just for her. Now, there's a, there's a little question I have. I don't have the answer to this one. Maybe you'll wrestle with this afterwards. It specifically says that when they filled the last jar, it stopped flowing. What if they'd collected five more jars? <laughs> what if they'd worked a little harder? But that's not an option. We don't really know what that means. It's, it's interesting that, you know, something along the lines of, of uh, God's not going to overwhelm us with more than our faith can hold. They sold, presumably they sold the oil, paid off the debt, and had some left over to continue living. Now, I know that there's more stories in the Bible that teach different things, and sometimes we do have to change course. Like Jonah, he had to change course. He, he, he'd chosen on purpose the wrong path. So I'm not, I'm not arguing against that kind of thing. If the course you've chosen is not towards godliness, if the course you've chosen is intentionally and on purpose away from godliness, yeah, we need to change course and do something different with our life than we have been doing. But I'm talking here about faithful people, the wife of a prophet who's been faithfully serving God for years, recognized to the point where other people want to be trained by them. Yet still, the difficulties come in in life. Despite their faithfulness, every one of us faces difficulties sometimes. And so in this story, I find it so encouraging. It's just like our drive in the mountains. Maybe we made a bad choice. We shouldn't go to Jasper. We wanted to see the mountains along the Icefields Parkway. We wanted to see the glaciers. Maybe we should turn around and just sit in the hot tub. But we kept driving and we saw the glory of God. And I think that's the answer very often for ourselves as individuals, for you as a church. When you started, did you pick a road aimed at being godly people? Well, maybe the fog's okay. Maybe you need to slow down a little bit, but just keep going. Don't know when, don't know how, but God will fill the jugs. 
He'll give you just enough struggle to make you hungry to depend on Him and not your own resources. And He'll give you just enough glory to keep praising Him along the way. He'll give you what your faith can handle, what your faith can hold. So just keep going. It's often the best advice. That's the advice to this woman with just a little bit of oil left. Just keep doing what you were doing and trust God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we, we began by opening your word and and as, as we reflect on these different bits of your word, um, things that, that come into our lives uh, that we can relate to, Lord, I just pray for, for each one here. I don't know the struggles they face. Uh, in the prayer requests, I, I got a little tiny insight to some of the struggles, but Lord, you know everyone. You know where the fog is thickest in this room, in people's lives. So Lord, I do pray that you would give them the, the ability to understand and trust and know that the mountains are still there, even if they can't see them. That your pr provision has been given at, and that your wisdom is greater than our wisdom. And you know how long the, the storm should last and you know when it should lift and you know what would happen, what would need to be done uh, to lift that. And so God, I pray for faithfulness along this journey. It's not always easy, but it leads to glory. So to glory, uh, we give ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.